Well, do you remember when the Lord touched you? It's a touch you never forget. You never get over. You're always changed because of his touch and his help upon us. Not only has he touched us, we can touch him. We have a high priest that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities. Thank God for his blessings. The Spirit of God that was here this morning is so good to see you here tonight. I believe the Lord is coming soon. I'm getting excited about the rapture. Praise God. And that glad reunion day, everybody will be happy over there. Praise God. We're not doomed here. We're not stuck here. When we die, we're not, that's not the end of it. We've got a hope and we've got a promise. We're going to be together forevermore. And that's why we're here tonight. Because we want to be ready. We want to make our calling and our election sure. Praise the Lord. Don't, don't forget about service Wednesday night, 7 o'clock. We hope that you'll come and be with us for our Bible study and family training hour. And then next Sunday, of course, we're in a brand new month already, the month of June. We'll be having communion on Sunday morning. So prepare your hearts for that. Would you stand as we get ready to go to the Lord in prayer? Just remember those tonight that are sick, that are in need of God's healing touch. We miss uh, Veronica today. She had a procedure done the other day and she's not with us. Pray God would touch her and heal her. And Caitlin has filled in and done an outstanding job today, hasn't she? Praise the Lord. Also continue to pray for Amy Griffin. The Lord would touch her. I understand she's doing better tonight. We miss her. Pray that God will heal her completely. Also Beth and Alex. Pray God will touch them and heal them and deliver them from their upper respiratory infection that they're having to deal with. Also the Fitzgeralds where the Mike went into the hospital the other day for uh, his heart irregularity and they got that straightened out. He's home. I pray God continue to touch him and heal him. And also Kathy Harris is continuing to do better and better and pray that God will continue to strengthen her and make her whole. Thank God for his healing touch. Amen. Do you have unspoken requests but lift of hand? Let's believe the Lord for these needs tonight. Pray especially for someone that you know that's lost that God would speak to their hearts. Father, we thank you tonight that we can come together to worship you. What a mighty God that you are. We are so blessed and so privileged to be able to serve you and live for you, to bring before you our petitions and our requests, to know, Lord, tonight you're able to bring healing to sick bodies. You're able to remove the pain, the discomfort, the fevers. You're able, Lord, to restore the health. We know that you're the great healer, the great physician, the great I am. We ask you to touch them tonight, strengthen their bodies, Touch those tonight, Lord, who are grieving and brokenhearted. We ask you to uplift those who are discouraged. Touch those that are lost above all, that they would be saved. We pray your blessings upon this service tonight. We give you praise for all these things. For it's in Jesus' name we pray and ask it all. Amen and amen. Would you take a moment, welcome one another tonight to the Matthew Church of God. We're delighted to have you. Good evening. It's time to receive the tithes and offerings. I once had a co-worker uh, approach me several years back and ask me a question directly. He said, let me get this straight. He said, you give 10% of your paycheck to the church? <clears throat> I smiled and responded, no. I'd give 10% of my gross income to God. And anything above that is offering. It's him, it's his to begin with. He responded, wow, I don't see how in the world you can afford to do that. I said, man, I can't afford not to. 
Without him, I wouldn't even have a job. And neither would you, for that matter. I said, you see, the world doesn't understand that. When it's in him that we live and breathe, tithing is part of our worship and obedience to him and should be done with joy and cheerfulness. 2 Corinthians 9, 7 says, each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, please take these tithes and offerings and use it for your glory and to further build your kingdom. Please bless the gift and the giver today. And we ask all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen.
you are not a god created by human hands you are not a god dependent on any mortal man you are not a god in need of anything we can give by your plan that's just the way it is
Hallelujah. Aren't you glad he's on his throne tonight? What comfort there is in knowing that regardless of what's going on in the world, God's on his throne. As long as God's on his throne, everything's going to be all right. Praise God. Thank you, singers and musicians tonight, blessing us once again. Praise God for his presence. Thank God for your coming back tonight. I want to get Lot out of Sodom, don't you? You know, years ago, people wouldn't dare miss an episode of who shot J.R. They had to figure out who shot him. But I want to find out what's going to happen to Lot. He's in Sodom this morning. How are we going to get him out of there? And how are we going to get out of here? Praise God. I want to continue tonight with the message I began this morning. I want to read, I think it's worth reading again in Ezekiel chapter 16, beginning with verse 49. Ezekiel 16, 49 through 50. Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. Pride, fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and the needy. They were haughty and committed abomination before me. Therefore I took them away as I saw good. I want to continue tonight with a message on the sins of Sodom the spirit of this world. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for this day and your wonderful presence we have felt. Help us, Lord, tonight to have the revelation of your holy word. Help us to be keenly aware how near we are to the end of this world as we know it. Help us to be aware tonight that judgment is coming upon this earth. We must be ready. We must be prepared for the day of your appearing. And we must warn others of their need to call upon your name, to seek your face, and to be saved. Help us tonight to break through every barrier, tear down every stronghold, to overcome every hindrance. Let us keep our minds stayed on you. We welcome you, Holy Ghost. We welcome your unction, your anointing, your ability that only you can give. We pray tonight, God, that you would touch every heart and every soul. We praise you, Lord, for all you've done today. Thank you for what you're doing and about to do. In Jesus' name we pray and ask it all. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Genesis chapter 19, verse 1. And there came two angels to Sodom at evening, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom because that was a place of government. It was a place of commerce. It's where the citizens did business. Evidently, Lot had gained a great deal of recognition. He had gotten to a place to where he was exalted to a position, been, been elevated in the city and among his peers. He may have been a city councilman. He may have been the mayor of Sodom. He could have been a commissioner with power and influence. His influence was, was reaching, far reaching. The influence of Sodom, that is, was far reaching. Not only did it influence Lot, it influenced his wife, it influenced his daughters, and it influenced his sons-in-laws. Things went from bad to worse rather quickly. God sent angels to warn Lot to get out because the cities were about to be destroyed. God sent special messengers, special angels to warn Lot to flee the city. What a wake-up call. What a wake-up call. But, oh, God is still sending wake-up calls today. There are things that are happening in nature. There's things that are happening around the world. There's things that happen in our lives that are wake-up calls. God's trying to get our attention, to get us to wake up to the lateness of the hour and the urgency of the hour. Luke 17, 28, Jesus said people were eating in Sodom. They were drinking. They were buying. They were selling. They were planting. They were building, carrying on business as usual without regard for their sins, just living casually, living as they pleased, 
without any concern about what was about to happen. Does that not describe the world today? That people have heard it, but they don't believe it. They've been warned, but the warnings have gone unheeded. People are living today just like they were in Sodom. The judgment of God is about to come upon this earth. And yet people live as they've always lived. Lot invited these two men who appeared as men, but they were angels, into his home to spend the night, to, to rest. Notice what it said in verses 4 and 5 in Genesis 19. But before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, can pass the house round, both old and young, all the people from every quarter. And they called unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the men which came into thee this night? Bring them out unto us that we may know them. Things were so bad in the city of Sodom that these men of the city tried to get to these angels so that they could have their way with them. Lot went outside his door. He closed the door behind him. And the Bible said he pleaded with these men, with the citizens of Sodom. And he said to them, he said, I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly. Do not so wickedly. He knew that they were wicked. He knew that what they wanted to do was wickedness. He knew that what they wanted to do was evil. Now, I hate to preach about something that is so vulgar, something that is so vile, and something that is so filthy, but it needs to be preached, especially in this last day and hour. Such a horrible thing, such a terrible thing has taken place. And there's no way that you could have convinced Lot. You never could have told him that when he pitched his tent towards Sodom that this was what was going to happen. But they had squeezed him into their mold. They had gotten him adjusted. They had gotten him accustomed to what was going on there. And there's so many people tonight who never dreamed that they would be in the condition they are spiritually. They never dreamed that they would be in the position that they are tonight. But all they become conformed to the world and they drifted as they pitched their tent towards Sodom but the sins of, of Sodom and the spirit of this world has taken its toll upon them the angel said to Lot get your family and get out of Sodom the city had come under the judgment of God and the angel said the Lord sent us to destroy this place Lot told his sons-in-laws, he went to them, and he said, get out of this place, for the Lord is going to destroy the city. But he seemed as one that mocked unto them. He seemed as one that mocked unto them. Proverbs 14 and 9 says, fools make a mock at sin. And that's what his sons-in-laws did. They just mocked at him. Old man, you don't know what you're talking about. The world mocks at sin. They mock the message of God. They mock the word of God. And they say there's nothing going to happen. Nothing has happened, so it must not be going to happen. But I'm here to tell you tonight, we're closer to the coming of Jesus Christ than we really understand. We're on the brink of the judgment that's coming upon this earth and it begins once the church is called away. Sin starts out small, but it becomes big. A joint is small, but then it becomes a kilo. A sip is small, but then it becomes a pint. A look is small, but then it becomes a gaze. A fix is small, but then it becomes an addiction. Little by little, things begin to mount up. Proverbs 20 and 17, bread of deceit is sweet to a man, but afterwards his mouth shall be filled with gravel. It starts out seemingly so innocent. It starts seemingly as something that, that's uh, insignificant, but then it begins to build and it gets worse and worse. Here was Lot, he had been, had been living out on the suburbs of Sodom. He'd been living on the outskirts 
of the city but then he began to move within the city because the devil if he can get you to take one step he'll get you to take two it's a miserable person, a miserable individual that is out of fellowship with God. When God saved us, he didn't fix us so that we couldn't sin again. He didn't fix us to so that we would not fail again, but he fixed us to so that, that where we, if we sin, we could no longer enjoy sin. We could no longer indulge in sin, but there's something happens to us if we err, if we deviate, if we get off course. The Spirit Spirit of God convicts us to get us back in line. And the Bible said that things had gotten so bad in Sodom that it vexed his soul. He was vexed in his soul and his spirit was grieved. There's something wrong if we can live in Sodom and it doesn't bother us. If we can see what's going on around us and it has no effect upon us. If we can hear the things that we hear and it does not disturb us, it should grieve our spirit because the spirit of God is within us and it grieves the spirit of God we feel what the love of God has done in us and it's caused us to have compassion for the lost and it caused us to be concerned for those who are in sin and in danger it's sad to see so many church members who have fallen under the influence of the world Falling under the influence of Sodom. They become so chummy with the world until they can sit around and sip cocktails and they can swig on a beer and they can trade dirty jokes and dirty stories and it doesn't seem to bother them. Abraham, the Bible said, could not find 50. He could not find 40. He could not find 30. He could not find 20. He could not even find 10 righteous people in Sodom. I wonder how many he could find in the church theme days. Where are the righteous people of God? Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. We must be born again. We must be washed in the blood of Jesus. Religion will not get you to heaven. Trying to do good works will not get you to heaven. You must know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Your sins must be under the blood. Going to church will not get you to heaven. Taking your Bible with you where you go will not get you into heaven. Only the blood of Jesus Christ applied to the heart of our heart, the doorpost of our heart will get us into the gates of heaven. Verse 49 said, Behold, there was iniquity of thy sister Sodom, pride, fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness. This was the land of plenty. This is what attracted Lot to the city of Sodom. Fullness of bread, plenty was there. Ruth, you know, left Bethlehem went to Moab because they had plenty over Moab. At Moab, she left the house of bread to go to the land of Moab, a land of idolatry, and she regretted it later. They had more than they knew what to do with in Sodom. They had plenty. The rich farmer, the Bible said, didn't have anywhere to bestow all these fruits, so he said, I'm going to build bigger. I'm going to build better. I'm going to have much goods laid up for many years and I'll take my ease. The rich man had plenty, but he refused to share with the beggar Lazarus. Even the dogs had more compassion than the rich man did. There was a foreigner that came to the United States and visited the United States, and they said, what was it that impressed you the most about our nation? And he said to that person that asked him the question, the size of their garbage cans. The size of their garbage cans, the refuse, the, the what we throw away, the waste that we have is enormous compared to other parts of the world. But spiritually, we can become like the Laodiceans who said we are rich, we're increased with goods, and we have need of nothing. Every time an altar call is given and the altars remain empty, it's people saying, I have need of nothing. I don't need to pray. I don't need to go to the altar. But I want you to know that regardless of, of our 
estimation of ourselves, Jesus said to the Laodiceans, you might think you're rich. You might think that you're increased with goods and have need of nothing. But he said the truth is you're wretched, you're miserable, you're poor, you're blind, and you're naked. You need to buy a meat gold that's tried in the fire. You need to anoint your eyes with eye salve that you can see. You need to put raiment upon you to hide the shame of your nakedness. We need God and we cannot make it without him. Our own righteousness is nothing more than filthy rags, but we need the righteousness of God through Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. The people of Sodom must have felt secure because they had an abundance of things. People these days have security systems. They have money in the bank to fall back home. They have insurance policies. They have all sorts of things that they depend upon and they feel secure. They felt secure in Sodom. They had so much, such an abundance. But it's this fullness of bread that produces idleness. The old saying is idle hands are the devil's workshop. It's a major problem we're having today is idle hands. There's plenty of work, but there's not enough workers. Even Jesus said the harvest is great, but the laborers are few. There's very few that are willing to work. Help wanted signs are everywhere you turn. People are begging for workers. They're, they're offering bonuses to people. They'll say, just come and fill out an application and we'll give you a bonus just to sign up to go to work with us. Oh, it's a time of idleness when idle hands are getting people into trouble. Jesus said of the man who buried his talent that he was a wicked and he was a slothful servant. When the unemployment rate goes up, crying goes up because people are idle and they had plenty to do usually when school is out during the summer the crime rate goes up because young people are not involved in the school and they have idle time to do mischief one of the surest ways for somebody to lose the victory is to do nothing God help us help us if we stop working if we stop laboring I want to tell you what motivates me is the word of God that says if you're faithful over a few I'll make you ruler over many some say I'll do a great thing I'll do a great work but the Lord said I want you to give a cup of water I want you to do the menial task I want you to do the small things because he takes notice of everything that we do one of the surest ways to lose your victory is to stay away from church, to stop reading the Bible, to stop praying, to stop working for God. If you don't believe staying out of church will have an effect on you, look at what has happened over the last year. There's people who will never come back to church. There's people that stop going to church and they will never come back. That's the effect it's had upon them. I believe going to church will give you an appetite to go back to church again. I believe getting in the presence of God. You'll say, I can't wait to get back to church. I can't wait to get back to the house of God. If we've lost our affection for church, if we've lost our affection for fellowship with the saints, if we've lost our affection to worship, then there's something seriously wrong in our spiritual lives. You can't sit on idle hands and expect the blessings of God. God is looking for somebody who will say, Lord, here am I. Send me. He's looking for somebody who will say, Lord, what would you have me to do? He's looking for somebody who will say, I'll sing the song. I'll teach the class. I'll play the instrument. I'll do the pitting. Whatever you need me to do, I'm going to work for the king. I'm going to work till he comes. I'm going to labor till he comes. Our society has become plagued with addictions. It has been one of the great sorrows out of this lockdown that is taking place. You've read the stories of people committing suicide, people becoming addicted during this time of depression. Alcoholism is a problem that affects one out of three families, and yet society keeps on saying, go for the gusto. Relax, it's Miller time. Or for all you do, this bud is for you. The world encourages you to drink and to party and to stay drunken. They don't show you the grief stricken families affected by a drunk driver. They don't show you the distraught mothers and fathers affected by a drunken teenager. 
They don't show you the women and children that have been abused by a drunken father or husband. They don't show you the shame of men and women wallowing in their own vomit. They don't show you that. They don't show you the ugly side. But that's how the devil operates. He wants you to think it's all roses, it's all wonderful, it's all pleasant, it's all pleasure, it's all good time. He doesn't show you the downside, but the Bible tells us what's going to happen. Oh, at first it, it stingeth like a serpent, it biteth like an adder. It comes to you, it seems so good, but then there's the, the destruction, there's the poison that follows with it. God help us to be sober. This is no time to be drunken. This is no time to, to be out of our minds, delirious with the things of this world. We better be sober. The Bible said there's a devil on the on the prowl and be sober, be vigilant. We're to shake ourselves and to wake ourselves lest we find ourselves sleeping when Jesus comes. The fullness of bread, the abundance of idleness often leads to drug addiction and suicide. It's a combination in Sodom of sexual perversion, pride and arrogance, fullness of bread and abundance of idleness. So here's Lot. He's gotten adjusted. He's gotten settled in Sodom. That vile and that wicked city had gotten a grip on Lot. He couldn't get free. He was bound in the city of Sodom. He never would have pitched his tent towards Sodom if he had known this was going to happen. But as soon as his soul became vexed, he should have gotten out of Sodom. That should have told him something. You need to get out of this place. When you feel you're in the wrong place, when you feel in your spirit, I don't belong here. When you feel like you're around the wrong people, you need to listen to that voice and you better obey that voice. But Lot never had the will and the power to get out of Sodom. God had given Lot opportunities to escape, to get out of there. God always makes a way of escape, the Bible says. People say, well, I couldn't help it. But God said, I'll make a way for you. I'll make a way of escape. A confederate army of kings invaded Sodom and Gomorrah. They came in and took away the inhabitants and all their goods. They looted the city. And all the people were captured, including Lot and his family. The Bible says Abraham heard about it. He armed 318 of his servants. They went after these this confederation, and through a divine miracle of God, he overcame the enemy. He was able to get back and bring back all the goods, all the people, bring Lot back with his family, brought them all back, able to do that. It took God to intervene. Lot had received a supernatural deliverance from Sodom. But instead of leaving that wicked city, this was his time to get out. This was an opportunity for him to leave. He went straight back into Sodom. Unlike his uncle Abraham, Abraham knew he didn't belong in Sodom. He knew that wasn't a place for him. He said, he said, where are you going, Abraham? Where are you going, Uncle Abe? He said, I'm looking for a city that has foundations whose builder and maker is God. This whole world is not my home. Oh, but there's pleasures here and there's fun times here and there's this going on and that going on. But Abraham said, I've got my eyes set on something far greater than anything this world can afford. And the people saw Abraham worship and they saw Abraham pay tithes and they saw Abraham walk humbly before the Lord. He even refused to accept a reward for rescuing the city. He said, I won't even take a shoelace out of this city. He showed them that he saw them as a wicked people that they were. He said, I don't want any part. I don't want to have anything to do with you. I don't want to get adjusted to this world, to this world. I don't want to get settled down here. I don't want to get situated here. I've got my heart set on something far beyond this world. He said, I don't belong here. Yet despite all of this, Lot refused to leave Sodom. He became attached to the city. If we aren't careful, we can get attached. We can get adjusted here until we lose sight of the world to come. God wants you to understand tonight that no man can bring you out of Sodom. Not even a godly man like Abraham could get Lot out of Sodom. All the promises, all the resolutions, all the good intentions can't get you out of Sodom. 
I'm going to do better. I'm going to quit doing these things. I'm going to act better. I'm going to change. But you fail every time because you can't get yourself out. Just trying to do better, just trying to get out will leave you with frustrated. There's a lot of people like Lot tonight. They're struggling. They're struggling in this whole world. I hear people talking about giving up. You know, I, I can't swim. But I tell you, I would try to learn how to swim in a hurry if I fell in a, in a load of water, if I fell in a boat load of water, if I fell in water over my head, I'd do a lot of kicking, a lot of, uh, I'd do a lot of splashing, I'd do a lot of grabbing, I'd grab hold of anything I could because I know the soon as I give up, I'm going to sink to the bottom and I'm going to drown. So I'm going to fight, I'm going to struggle, I'm going to do what I have to do to stay above the water, keep my head above the water. Let me tell you, don't you you dare give up because help is on the way, an answer's on the way, a deliverer's on the way. He's not going to let you sink as long as you call out to him. You've got to get to the place to where you realize you don't have the power to escape. It took Israel 400 years of affliction to learn that they could not provide their own deliverance. 400 years, they had to have a deliverer. And God sent Moses to deliver them. We've got a deliverer in Jesus Christ. I want to tell you, he'll show up every time. Just when you think you're about to go under for the third time, he'll show up. He'll come walking on the sea. He'll come in the middle of the night. He'll come to your rescue. Hallelujah. He's the rescuer. He's the deliverer. He's the ever-present help in trouble. All you've got to do is call. And he said, I'll answer you. I'll come to where you are. You might think you're about to be inundated. You might think you're about to sink. You might think that you're about to be overwhelmed. But my hand is not too short that it cannot save. And my ear is not too heavy that he cannot hear. He'll hear your faintest cry and he'll answer pie and pie. He will deliver you. Lot was giving the warning. Get out quickly. But Lot didn't take the warning seriously. There's a lot of people that are not taking the warning seriously. The Bible says he slept so soundly until the angels had to wake him up the next morning. He didn't want to leave Sodom. In fact, the scripture says he lingered. He lingered behind in Sodom. They had to literally grab Lot and his family and pull them out of the city. One of these days, Jesus Christ is coming again. He is going to grab us. He's going to snatch us up. That's what that word rapture means. It means to be snatched up, to be called away. He's going to snatch us up out of this sin-cursed world, this cesspool of wickedness and sin, this, this miriness, this uh, evilness that's in the world that seeks to pull us under. He's going to catch us away. There's going to be a shout, praise God. The trumpet's going to sound, and the Lord shall descend from heaven with a shout. Uh, not only will he snatch us up out of this earth, he'll snatch up the dead in Christ out of their graves. He'll catch away the dead saints and the righteous saints to be with him forevermore. Genesis 19, 16, and, but Lot hesitated, lingered. The men took hold of his hand, the hand of his wife and the hands of his two daughters because the Lord was merciful. Aren't you glad for the mercy of God? The Lord was merciful to him for Abraham's sake. And they brought him out and left him outside the city with his family. Lot was lingering on the brink of destruction without any strength of his own to get out. But God delivered him. That's the mercy of God. If it had not been for the Lord on our side, if it had not been for the Lord coming to our rescue, Romans 5 and 6, 4, when we were yet without strength, when we were without strength, in due time Christ died. For the ungodly, we had no strength. In miry clay and sinking sand, going down for the last time, going to be eternally doomed, eternally lost. But all oh, while we were without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. He reached down and lifted us up out of the miry clay, out of the horrible pit, and set our feet upon a solid rock and established our goings. Sodom was costly, costly to Lot. Lot lost dearly. He lost so much, he lost his wife. He lost Mrs. White. I don't know what she, what she got involved in. I don't know what she was doing in the, 
in the city of Sodom. Maybe she was the head of the garden club. Maybe she got promoted in some position in society. But she loved Sodom. Whatever you do, don't fall in love with this world. Whatever you do, don't get an affection for this world. She had such an affection, such love for Sodom. She was warned when you get out of here, don't you dare look back. You keep looking, looking on, keep pressing on. But the Bible says she looked back and became a pillar of salt. That's what happened to her. And then he lost his sons-in-laws, those sons-in-laws that mocked what he had to say. He lost his possessions and he almost lost his soul. If you're bound in sin, you're bound to suffer. God's judgment fell on Sodom, fell on Gomorrah. The scripture said fire and brimstone rained down from heaven. Now archaeologists, most Bible scholars believe that Sodom and Gomorrah, those cities were up under where now is the Dead Sea. And archaeologists have gone there in that location. They put down grappling hooks and the only thing they could retrieve was molten sulfur which is brimstone that's been burned. Jesus said the same day that they went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Judgment came in a moment of time. I want our musicians to come if they will and singers. Peter and Jude tells us the same thing. Second Peter 2 and 6 and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that have after should live ungodly. He said they're an example. They're an example to us at what's going to happen. God hasn't destroyed America. He hasn't destroyed the wicked nations of the world yet. But you can be sure that judgment is coming according to the word of God. God wants to deliver us out of Sodom. He wants to deliver us out of this world. He wants us to get out of here before destruction comes. Sin always brings judgment. It always does. And the only hope we have is Jesus Christ. The only hope we have is this precious book that he's given us to live by. There's no other way of escape except through Jesus Christ. Would you stand with me, please? The only hope we have is the grace and the mercy of God. He was able to escape because of God's mercy. Get out. Run to the mountain of God, he said. There's a hiding place there. There's a place we can go to I'm telling you tonight church we are running out of time running out of time we're, we're so near the coming of the Lord the rapture of the church the tribulation people are saying what does these things mean all these things that are happening Jesus said these are all signs of his soon return there's no better time to get right with God than now yet people just continue to go on People at one time were on fire for God, have lost their fire, have lost their fear of God, they've lost the, the vigor, the vitality they one time had. Let me tell you, this is a personal thing. You've got to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. You can't expect somebody else to do it for you. You've got to get a hold of God yourself and say, Lord, I want to do what I can. I want to live the best I can live. I want to maintain the fire, the relationship that I have with you. I want to live for you every day. Would you come tonight? Let's find a place to pray. Let's rededicate, recommit, surrender to the Lord and ask God to help us to keep vigilance, to keep watching, to keep praying, to keep working, to keep laboring, to keep looking, and also to warn others judgment is coming upon this earth just like it fell on Sodom and Gomorrah it's going to fall upon this world oh praise God praise God
Oh, would you give the Lord praise tonight, hallelujah, for the promise he's given to us. We're not doomed to remain in the city of Sodom.